my faith was materialism. What I believed in all of my PhD friends and all of my friends believed that if you can't measure it, see it, weigh it, count it, it simply doesn't exist. So when I was dying, people asked me if I prayed and it's like, I'm trying to explain to you like the last thing in the world I would have done was pray. I whether I would have sooner jumped off the Eiffel Tower than pray. I knew that my life was filth, garbage. I knew that I was a selfish ass. I knew that. I mean, in the world, I never would have admitted that to you. If you if if you and I had met, if you'd met me as. Uh, Howard Storm, Professor Howard Storm, you know, at Northern Kentucky University. Get you to admire me and be a fan, you know? All, all, you, all you would be to me is someone to support my ego. I hope and pray that nobody ever goes through what I went through because I have never told anyone what really happened and what it was like for me. It was really bad, really, really bad. And I think it was an incredible gift of love that God gave me to do that. The pain of the uh, hole in my duodenum, which was leaking hydrochloric acid and other delightful digestive juices. I was dissolving myself. I was digesting myself on the inside. And if you wonder what that feels like, get a red hot coal out of a fire and stick it inside your gut. I'd seen two doctors in emergency, and they were very nice, but they didn't do anything. They just sent me over to surgery. They told me I had an hour to live. You know, I, I found it the easiest thing in the world to die. I was having a lot of trouble breathing. I woke, I was standing there. I felt absolutely physically more real, more alive, and completely healed than I'd ever known. So the first thing I did was I did a reality check. I know it sounds very rational, but that's I was a very rational person. I can hear the hum of the fluorescent lights in the ceiling, hear them humming really loudly. And then I looked and I realized that in, in our, you know, I was an art teacher. So like in our vision, we see 180 degrees with two, if you have two eyes. Well, I was seeing way more than 180 degrees. And I'm going, ooh, that's so weird. So I'm looking around the room and my wife's on the other side of the bed. And then I notice in the bed, mostly covered by a sheet, but the head, not completely covered, was a person. And I looked at the person who was facing my wife away from me. And to my horror, it bore a remarkable resemblance to me. Now, I knew rationally that that wasn't me. And then I tried to communicate with my wife, her head down and tears running down her cheeks. And I get no response. And it was like infuriating. Hell is um, separation from God. And the only thing that makes hell bad is um, the people there. God doesn't make hell bad. If they were nicer to each other, it'd be a lot more pleasant down there than it is. In their separation from God, it also means all the good things that God gives us. What psychologists have found when they cage a bunch of animals in a cage for a period of time, they start gnawing on each other because that's the only gratification they get. In prison movies, there's a concept of the new fish. When a, you know, when a new inmate comes into the prison, like everybody's excited because they want to initiate them, which usually means um, brutal rape and other things, right? So I was new fish. So hundreds of them had their way with me. The physical part is awful, but the emotional part is much worse than the physical part. You know, I, you know, when it was happening and after it happened, it's like, how could they want to hurt me that much? Why do they hate me that much? You know what I mean? That's that's the part I couldn't. I and I and and I and I can't understand because you know what. I, I know why now, because they don't care. They, they weren't they were doing it to me personally. It was just, I was new fish. And when they were done with me, um, 
by being done with me is I, I was no longer responsive physically and emotionally uh, too far gone. You know, the term that I like to describe was I was roadkill. In that place, I heard a voice that said, pray to God. I literally heard, I mean, I literally heard a voice say, pray to God. I don't know who said that. I don't know where it came from. It kind of felt like it was like here coming out of my chest. And I thought, what a stupid idea. I don't believe in God. I don't pray. And the voice said, pray to God. And I thought, I don't know how to pray. I haven't prayed since I was a kid. You know, it's like, I don't pray. I'm not a prayer. Forget it. The voice said, pray to God, real strong. And I thought, okay, what would it look like for me to pray? And so I'm thinking, okay, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States. Oh, no, no, no. Four score and seven years ago, our forefathers brought forth in this continent a new nation. No, 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 no. Oh, man, I can't think, you know, like, I mean, I'm, I'm remembering things I've memorized because, of course, from my perspective, 38-year-old 30 genius college professor, department head, I thought prayer was something you memorized when you were a child. So I'm trying to remember, and like I finally come up with the, I come up with like the Lord is my shepherd, <gasps> and I'm so excited. I murmured it. I, I mean, I wasn't. I murmured it out of excitement that I actually remembered something that sounded like a prayer. And upon doing that, the people that were still around me, which they were no longer um, interacting with me because I had become tedious and uninteresting. They became very angry. And they said to me in language that's the worst language I've ever heard in my life. There is no God. Nobody can hear you. And now we're going to really, really hurt you. Like basically telling me what we did before was nothing compared to what we're going to do to you now. Because they couldn't bear like my most miserable, pathetic little prayer. And then I thought of some other things, like our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And I mean, I was only I was only remembering like phrases. I couldn't remember like a whole verse. I'm saying this stuff, and it's really making them angry. And the thing that I liked was um, all this time I'd been defenseless. Is no matter how hard I had fought to fend them off me, finally I find something they really don't like. And the other thing I noticed that the more I said these things, and I was shouting them. I was shouting him in anger. The more I said these things, the more it drove them away. And I could, I could, <clears throat> we're in peach black, so I can't see anything, but I can, I can hear them retreating and retreating and retreating. So like, yippee, one, yippee, skippy. I'm like, I'm, I'm really making him mad and I'm driving him away. So I'm like letting them have it with this stuff. And I'm just repeating this stuff over and over again. I realized that I, I belonged in the place that I was and that I was stuck there and nothing was ever going to change it, and that the only way that I could um, have any kind of an existence in that place was to somehow pull myself together and to become more vicious than they were. In other words, before you got a chance to bite me in the neck, I'll rip your head off. That would be our greeting. You know, you go for my neck and I rip your head off. And I thought, I'd rather not exist than live like that because I, I'd rather not be than be one of them. So now I'm in a dilemma because here I am. There's no way out. I have no way, no way of knowing how yet they're going to come back. And I can't, I can't count on this, this prayer bit, which was quite insincere. You know, I mean, it wasn't from my heart. It was just like, it worked. It was, but I mean, how, how, much, how long is that gonna work for me, you know? And I went into the deepest, deepest despair. You know, I mean, I get so I'm mean, having all this stuff going on, and then like finally I'm like screaming in my head, like, stop it, stop it, stop it. And I just yell out into the darkness, pure desperation, Jesus, please save me. Without the faintest idea, whether there was a Jesus or not a Jesus, or whether he liked me or didn't like me, or, you know, I mean, I had, I had nothing except this faint hope that it might be true. This impossibly bright light, like if it was actually light light, it would have it would have burned me. I was like, you know, so overwhelmed by the brightness of the light and its beauty. And then like, I looked down at myself and I saw gore and I was like, ew, I had been eviscerated, okay? 
um, not pretty. And out of the slide came hands and arms and he touched me. And when he touched me, three things happened. One is all the gore just started to disappear and I became whole. The other thing that happened was I was filled with ecstasy instead of being um, simply just nothing but pain from head to foot. Now all of a sudden that the pain goes away and I'm filled with ecstasy. And lastly, and most importantly, um, I experienced a love that I had never known that existed. And unfortunately, I haven't found any language yet that can begin to describe it. He picked me up. He held me real tight. Thing when he held me, I knew that there was some, besides all this healing and love and all that, that he really, really liked me a lot. Matter of fact, I'm his favorite person in the whole universe. I have to add, unfortunately, you are too. And, and he likes me. I mean, he doesn't dislike me. He's not, he's not, you know, he's not mad at me. You know, he's happy. The God that I said wasn't, we're going to his house. We're going into his territory. I mean, I know that, I just know. I think to myself, he's made a terrible mistake, I don't belong here. And with that, eek, we come to a, a stop and we are outside of the world of light, which we could call heaven, because that's what it was. I call it home. He spoke to me for the first time telepathically and he said, we don't make mistakes, you belong here. And I thought, how do you know what I thought? I didn't say that. Can you hear what I think? And he laughed and he said, I know everything you've ever thought. And I thought, I feel real uncomfortable with you knowing everything I've ever thought because I've thought things that I don't want you to know that I thought. And immediately I thought of something that I didn't want him to know that I thought about, which was I thought of a breast. I've always, I've always been a boob guy. And you know what he did? He laughed and laughed and laughed. He thought it was really funny. And I thought, oh, he thinks I'm funny. He said, yeah, you're real funny. So we pr proceeded to watch my life. And that was a, what I would refer to as a holographic projection of me interacting with people. And the interesting thing was that there were props, but usually not a background, only when the background was appropriate. We got tables and chairs and a floor and the rest just isn't there at all. What I ultimately learned from the whole thing was that we were created to love one another. That's our job, that's the curriculum, that's the whole, the whole thing in a nutshell, and that's the only thing that matters. And what I was doing was moving away from that. I mean, I had a career, I had a wife, I had kids, I had a house, I had cars, you know, blah, blah, blah. I had all that, I had the American dream, and I was going somewhere, and I won prizes at art shows. And I got tenure, and I was a full professor, and I, you know, blah, blah, blah. And None of that mattered, and they let me know that none of that mattered at all. Matter of fact, it was, a, it was very surprising just for me because I'd say, look, look here. I got, you know, I'm a full professor. I'm 26 years old, full professor. Never, nobody gets that, you know? I'm like, yeah, well, that was of no consequence at all. Look, as, look here where you ignored a student who really, really needed a friend. And then they would feel so sad for that student, and it's good. And as the life review went on into my adult life, I was begging them to stop it. I'm like, I got it. I, no, 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 no. And they'd say, no, you got to watch. So we went through the whole thing. It was uh, brutal. And I made them very disappointed and very sad. But I got the point. It was real simple. We were here. We were supposed to love each other. And I completely missed it. I thought my life was about being the most famous, wealthiest, important, powerful person that I could possibly be. I mean, I wanted it all. When we were over with that whole thing, um, he said, do you have any questions? And I said, yeah, I got a million questions. So I asked him everything I could think of to answer. And he answered everything. He not only told me, but he showed me and we visited some places that the universe is full of um, intelligent beings and uh, varied life forms. And that, in fact, this world, is one of the lowest of them all. There's a lot more spiritual, kind, good, loving, and intelligent beings all over the universe. 
ran out of stuff to say. So I said, oh, okay, I want to go to heaven. And he's like, oh, uh, actually, you got to go back to the world and try and um, you know, have the life that you were created to be in the first place. So we had a huge argument. And people always say, like, argument. I go, yeah, I argued with him as much as I could possibly argue. I said, why would you send me back to the world? Because it's full of cruel, mean people, and it's just terrible existence down there. And he said, the world, he said, that's true. There's lots of cruel, mean people. And he said, there's also very loving, beautiful people. And he said, what's in your heart is what you'll find. And if you have love in your heart, you will see the love in other people. If you have beauty in other people, you'll see the beauty in them. He said, it's what's in you is what you're going to find. And you know what? Amazingly, he was right again. I've been doing this thing for over 30 years since, well, 33 years now, since 85. And yeah, if you seek love and beauty, you find love and beauty. If you seek cruelty and ugliness, you find cruelty and ugliness. But I'm telling you, the, the love and the beauty is in everywhere and in everyone, including people that do not strike you immediately as either loving or beautiful.